Last week, we introduced the multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, we defined the notion of regret, which we uh, proposed as a metric for comparing different algorithms. Uh, we also introduced some uh, elementary probability inequalities, which we'll use in our analysis of algorithms. Uh, this week, we are going to uh, introduce one of the main algorithms for the multi-armed bandit problem. Uh, in this unit, we'll be looking at uh, uh, one, in the first half of the unit, we'll be looking at one frequentist and one Bayesian uh, algorithm for this problem. Uh, and today we'll introduce the main frequentist one, which is called the UCB or upper confidence bound algorithm. Okay, we'll start by uh, recalling the model and setting out the assumptions before describing the algorithm. So uh, we consider a bandit with uh, K Bernoulli arms, and I'll say in just a moment uh, what that means. Uh, we will denote by X sub I of T the reward we get if we play um, I at time step T. Uh, this will be a, a real number. It could be negative and typically it will be random. And time is discrete. It takes values in the integers. Um, so we are going to make the following assumption uh, uh, through the next few lectures. So we are going to assume uh, that the rewards are mutually independent across arms. So if you look at the sequence xi for different i, these are independent sequences. Moreover, for each fixed arm i, the sequence xi t is of uh, independent and identically distributed random variables. So we have independence both across time and across arms. Okay. Uh, and finally, the random variables xi, t are going to have Bernoulli distributions with parameter mu sub i for the i term. Uh, let's remind ourselves what a Bernoulli distribution is. <clears throat> Uh, so a random variable has a Bernoulli distribution if it takes only two possible values, zero or one. Uh, you can think of ones as successes and zeros as failures. And the probability of taking the value one is mu i, is the parameter of the distribution. In particular, mu i is also the mean of this random variable xi. Okay. So that's a Bernoulli random variable. And when we say the arms are Bernoulli, what we mean is that the rewards on the arms are Bernoulli random variables. Um, much of what we say about the algorithm will generalize to other random variables. You can define the algorithm for arbitrary distributions. Uh, the analysis gets uh, very complicated in general, and so we are going to focus on the Bernoulli case. And that's why in describing the model as well, I have already specialized to the Bernoulli case. <clears throat> okay, uh, and finally, let's assume that we have ordered the arms in decreasing order of mean reward. So the first arm is the best. It has the highest mean reward mu one, uh, which we assume to be strictly bigger than the second best arm, which is then at least as good as the third best arm and so on. So there's a slight loss of generality in assuming that the best arm is unique. Uh, that can be relaxed, but we won't uh, bother with that. Okay, so there's a unique best arm and there may be ties for the second, third best and so on, or they may all be distinct as well. Um, <clears throat> of course, the player doesn't know the numbering of the arms, otherwise they would know which is the best arm and there would be uh, nothing for them to learn. Okay, so the player doesn't know the numbering, they, they uh, are just presented with these different arms and have to try them out and decide 
but for the purposes of analysis, we assume that the arms are ordered in this way. So sitting outside the system, we know the ordering of the arms. Uh, okay, we want to introduce a bit more terminology. Uh, we are going to denote by I of T the index of the arm played in time step T. Uh, so if let's say I of 10 is three, what that means is that uh, arm number three is played in time step 10. Uh, we'll denote by nj of t the number of times that arm j is played in the first t time steps. So let me explain this notation. Uh, the bold face one here denotes an indicator random variable. It's the indicator of the event within brackets. What does that mean? So this says that if uh, I S is J, so if the index of the arm played at time step S is J, then this random variable takes the value one. If it's something else, it takes the value zero. That's what this means. <clears throat> so uh, every time, uh, at every time step S that arm J is played, uh, that counts one towards the sum. So the sum is counting the number of times that arm J is played in the first T time steps. Okay, I hope that notation is clear. SJ of T is going to count the uh, total number of successes uh, from arm J in the first T time steps, which is the total reward. So again, it's the same sum, and every time for every S at which arm J is played, we take the random reward obtained by playing arm J at time step S, that's XJS, and we add up these random rewards at those times at which arm J was played, okay? So this is the total reward from arm J in the first T rounds. And for Bernoulli random variables, the total reward is just the number of successes. Finally, uh, mu hat is going to denote the sample mean reward. J uh, denotes the arm and denotes the number of time steps. So uh, the number of time steps that the arm is played. So mu hat Jn uh, is the total reward from arm J in its first 10 plays, the first 10 times it is played. So if we want to know the total reward from arm J up to time T, then this arm has been played NJ times up to time T, not the total reward, the sample mean reward. So uh, this ratio here, the total reward up to time T on arm J divided by the number of times arm J has been played, uh, gives us the mean reward from arm J up to time T, okay? And uh, of course, if NJT is zero, this is not well-defined, uh, but whenever this is at least one, the sample mean reward is well-defined. Okay, so uh, now we want to start introducing policies or algorithms for this problem. So what do we mean by a policy? A policy needs to specify for each possible time, which arm is played in that time. And recall that time is discrete, so we'll use round to denote uh, successive time steps. So policy is a family of functions ft, uh, which specify the arm played at each time step t. And what can this function ft depend on? <clears throat> well, it should only depend on information which is available to the player at time t. So it can depend on all the arms played at time steps up to time t minus one. So which arm was chosen to be played in previous time steps. <clears throat> 
It can also depend on the rewards <coughs> in the past, but recall that the reward is only observed for the arm you chose to play. Uh, we, didn't, we don't know what the reward was on arms that we didn't play. So in time step S, we played arm IS, so we only know the reward corresponding to that arm at time step S. So the history is the set of all arms played and all rewards obtained from those arms, and that's the history that's, that FT can depend on. Okay, uh, one uh, further slight modification. We are going to consider policies that are randomized. So the policy, so FT could look at the history up to time T <clears throat> and it could say, I'm not entirely sure which arm to play. I want to play the sum with probability 0.8 and the sum with probability 0.2. <clears throat> so it should have access to a coin, a biased coin with any probability which it can toss to decide which arm to play. And one way to get such a biased coin is to have a uniform random variable at each time step. And these are going to be IID as well. Uh, and so this is the extra information available to us at time step T, this uniform random variable, which we can use to simulate a coin toss with any bias we like. Okay. <clears throat> so FT can depend on the history of which arms were chosen, the observed rewards, and this extra bit of randomness, and will determine which arm is played at time t. So the index at time t is given by this function and different functions or different families of functions correspond to different algorithms or policies. And we want to find the best such family of functions. That, that's our goal. Okay, and what do we mean by best? Loosely speaking, it's one which minimizes the regret and the regret up to some time capital T is defined uh, as the expected difference between the best arm and the arm that was actually played at time step little t for each t between one and capital T. So we add up the regrets at the different time steps and that's the total regret up to time step T, okay? Recall that mu1 is the mean reward by playing arm 1. Mu it is the mean reward by playing arm it. So this difference here, this expected difference, is in expectation how much reward we would have lost by playing it instead of 1. So this is the regret at time step t. And we are taking the total regret in the first capital T time steps. Okay, and I've loosely said the objective is to minimize this. You could ask for what value of capital T are we minimizing it? That would give a well-posed problem. We want something more ambitious. We want to simultaneously minimize it for all possible capital T, and that's not possible in general. So uh, a better way to say it, uh, uh, or a bit more precise way to say it is that we want to minimize the growth rate uh, of this regret with capital T. And uh, as we go on, we'll see more specifically what this means more precisely. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the model fully specified and uh, the assumptions stated, uh, we've defined uh, precisely what a policy means, and we have said what, what our objective is. Okay, and uh, yeah, a final remark. In general, it's not possible to calculate the expectation of mu it explicitly. If we could, then this would be an easy calculation. Uh, and the reason we can't do this is that it depends in some complicated way on the history and um, the number of histories grows exponentially in time. Uh, at every uh, time step, 
there are k different choices. So in the first t time steps, there are k to the t choices. So the potential size, the size of history is gross exponentially. And we cannot, uh, in order to calculate this expectation, we would have to average over every possible history with the right probabilities. And that's not feasible to do. Okay. So instead, we'll focus on deriving bounds on the regret rather than exact calculations. Uh, okay, before we introduce the UCB algorithm, let's uh, first, uh, let's develop some intuition by first considering the most naive heuristic we could think of for this problem. And that's the following. So let's play E-charm exactly once. Uh, and then we look at the rewards obtained from these plays and we pick the best one. We pick the one on which we observe the highest reward. Now, if the rewards came from some continuous distribution, say the normal distribution, then with probability one, there would be a unique best arm. And this, would, uh, this heuristic would already be well-defined. Uh, but for us, we have a discrete distribution. And so uh, two or more arms could give you the exactly the same highest sample mean reward. And in that case, you have to find some way of breaking ties. And I don't care how you break them. You might break them uh, randomly. You might uh, have uh, some preference on the arms because you have uh, a lucky number and the number there's an the now so you are always going to pick arm three because you like the number three if there's a tie etc okay uh, so you uh, break ties as you wish and then uh, once you have decided you play that arm in all subsequent rounds so the it's only initially that you try out different arms as soon as you tried each out once, you make up your mind uh, forever and uh, pick your favorite arm and stick with that uh, uh, indefinitely into the future. That's the heuristic. Okay. okay, so if that's clear, now what we are going to do is see uh, what the regret of this heuristic is. We are going to analyze its performance. So how well does this do? Uh, okay, the first thing you can observe for our Bernoulli arm setting is that it picks the wrong arm with probability at least this much, mu two times one minus mu one. Why is this? What's mu two? It's the probability that this, there's a success on the second arm, that it gives you a reward of one. And one minus mu one is the probability that there's a failure on the first arm, that it gives you a reward zero. Uh, these arms are independent. So if both these events occur, meaning that arm one has reward zero and arm two has reward one, then uh, this heuristic is definitely not going to pick arm one, right? Because two has a higher reward. It might pick two, it might pick something else, which also gave a reward one, but definitely it's not picking one. And one was the best arm. Uh, so it makes the wrong decision with at least this probability uh, that arm one gave reward zero and arm two gave reward one. Okay. Okay, and if this happens, if it picks the wrong arm, then in all subsequent time steps, that wrong arm is played. So it's played t minus one times up to time t. Okay. And every time, uh, okay, so what's the total regret up to time t? It's at least the probability that you made the wrong choice initially uh, times, okay, this must be t minus k here uh, because you spent k, no, Okay, you played arm one just once and t minus one times you played other arms, it is t minus one. Okay, so back to regret. Uh, so the regret 
is every time you play the wrong arm, you get a regret of at least mu one minus mu two. Okay. Uh, it may be uh, more if your wrong arm was arm three or four or anything up to K, but it's at least this much. Uh, and with this probability, mu two times one minus mu one, you are incurring this regret for at least t minus one time steps. This should be a t minus one here rather than t. So your total regret up to time t is at least the probability of making the wrong decision times the regret per time step times t minus one time steps. Okay, so that's a lower bound on the regret for this heuristic. So what does that tell you? So this is, these are all positive constants. So what that tells you is that the regret grows linearly in T. It grows like some constant multiple of T, maybe, uh, maybe 0.5 T, maybe 0.001 T, but it's still growing linearly with T. Uh, okay, and the question we want to ask is, can we do better? And the first slight variation on this naive heuristic you might come up with is to say, okay, it's obviously silly to play each arm just once, that doesn't give you enough information, but let's play each arm a hundred times and then make up our minds. Uh, sure, that does better, that does much better. Uh, if you play each arm n times before making up your mind, uh, then, uh, then you do better, but how much better do you do? Uh, so what's the probability that after playing each arm n times, you still end up choosing the wrong arm? It's small, in fact, it decays exponentially in n, but it's still a constant that doesn't depend on capital T, right? Uh, it might be your probability of making a mistake might be two to the minus n, but it only depends on n, it doesn't depend on t. Uh, in other words, after this initial phase, if you've made a wrong choice, you're stuck with that wrong choice in perpetuity. You can never go back and change your mind. And so for large enough t, uh, the regret will still scale as some very, very small multiple of t, so it will still scale linearly in t. So you still have linear regret. Uh, and, uh, and that says that you should, um, okay, so that, that's, uh, so that says that experimenting for any fixed amount of time, even if it's a longer time, does not uh, take you away from linear scaling of the regret. So that might prompt a couple of questions. The first is, is it at all possible to do better? Is it possible to get sublinear regret scaling? And we'll see later on that it is possible. In fact, you can do a lot better. You can do something that grows very slowly as a function of t, a lot slower than linear. Um, another question more practical is, do we care? Uh, after all, if we can uh, make this probability of choosing the wrong arm exponentially small in n, then the time it takes to notice it in the regret, even if the regret is scaling linearly, it might take a thousand years before it has a noticeable impact. And that's, that's indeed a valid point. And um, so if, if you knew the time scale T over which you were making a decision, then the problem can be much simpler and you can just choose an N uh, depending on T to decide how long you want to this initial exploration phase to last, and then you can stop exploring. So in that sense, maybe the problems we study at this point are a bit artificial, but uh, Okay, but nevertheless, there are many settings where the numbers of decisions we make, uh, we want to make are enormous. Um, 
and uh, and so it is natural to look at problems which where you don't decide t in advance but where uh, where a single algorithm uh, performs well over a wide range of scales of times adapts itself Uh, okay, so that was a naive heuristic. I'm uh, still going to do a bit more heuristic reasoning before we introduce the UCB algorithm itself. So I want to motivate it a bit before introducing it. So what was wrong with the heuristic we uh, just studied? Uh, the problem with it was that it explored for a while, it calculated the sample mean, and then it chose an arm with the best sample mean. So it treated the sample as if it were the true mean. It assumed that the exploration phase already gave us an exact estimate of the true mean, and hence an exact ranking of the arms by the true mean and picked the best arm on that basis. And that, of course, is the wrong thing to do because the sample mean is a random variable. It's not a number, it's random. Uh, and um, so we should take that randomness into account. We need to take into account that we are uncertain about our estimates. So how do we do that? Um, okay, so let's, let's think about it this way. So let's say we have planned played arm um, i n times, and the sample mean reward we have observed is mu hat i n. Okay, so this is a random variable. Uh, it's not exactly mu i, but it's close to mu i, and based on n and this value, what can we say about mu i? So could we say, uh, uh, let's be a bit more concrete. So suppose you have played um, I a hundred times and you have observed a sample mean reward of uh, 0.4. And you want to ask, uh, could the true mean be bigger than 0.5? And I still saw 0.4. What's the chance that it's bigger than 0.5 or some other number, 0.42 or 0.75? So how big might the true mean be? Uh, and we can answer this question using Huffington's inequality and Huffington's inequality says the following. Uh, you'll have to do the calculation for yourselves, but let me just state the result. It tells us that if we observe a sample mean mu hat i n, the probability that the true mean is bigger than this by an amount x is bounded as follows. It's bounded as e to the minus two n x squared. Uh, and we can use Huffington's inequality. Recall that this was for random variables bounded on the closed interval zero, one. Our random variables, the rewards on the arms are Bernoulli random variables. So they take values either zero or one, the endpoints of this closed interval but still they lie within the closed interval. So we can apply Huffington's inequality. And it gives us, it tells us that the probability of that the true mean exceeds the sample mean by X is bounded above by this. Okay. So we have a sample mean reward. Uh, and let's use this inequality. Let's pretend equality holds here. And let's be optimistic. Let's say, uh, so we we may have played different arms for different numbers of time steps. And I'm going to say, what's my most optimistic estimate of the reward from arm I? I've observed a sample mean of 0.4. I'm going to pick the mu I here such that there's at least a delta chance uh, that uh, my true mean is mu i or bigger, okay? So if my sample mean is 0.4 and 
uh, the probability that mu i is bigger than 0.5 is delta, I might say, I'll take, I'll treat 0.5 as my estimate rather than 0.4, okay? <clears throat> uh, and delta here, uh, delta here is some number you pick. So it, it's a measure of how optimistic you are. You might say, I'm going to take a 50% chance. So <clears throat> I have an estimate of uh, a sample mean of 0.4. If there's a 50% chance that my true mean is bigger than 0.43, then I'll take 0.43 as my estimate. Or you may be very optimistic. You may say, if there's a 10% chance that my true mean is bigger than something, I'll take that. In which case your estimate for a 10% chance may be 0.5, whereas my estimate for a 50% chance may be 0.43. So, so we have different uh, uh, estimates depending on how optimistic we are. And Delta measures that. So if you want to have at least a Delta chance uh, of how big your true mean is, then uh, this, this is how you pick it. And by using Hufting's inequality, this tells you that you, you can exceed your sample mean <clears throat> by this amount. Okay, so let's again look at, focus on the scaling mainly. So there's a square root of one over n scaling here. So if you've played and arm i n times, you can add some constant multiple of square root one over n to the sample mean, and that will be your optimistic estimate uh, of the true mean on the sum. And uh, what constant multiple, that depends on how optimistic you are and what value of delta you consider acceptable. Okay, so this, uh, so this is similar to the naive heuristic we studied, but it adds a bit of bias towards less played arms. So if n is small, if an arm has not been played too many times, n is small, one over n is large, and so you add some multiple of square root one over n. You add a, a bigger uncertainty gap there's more uncertainty about the payoff on the term because it's been played few times. And because you are optimistic, you add a bigger amount of uh, uncertainty to that term and are more willing to explore it in future, okay? Uh, so a naive heuristic was bad because after the exploration phase, it stopped exploring certain arms altogether. Uh, altogether, anything except what it saw as the best one. And by adding a bit of bias towards less played arms, as one of the arms gets played more and more, the, the one you picked as the best gets played more and more in the future, other arms have a chance of coming back into play. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the motivation behind the UCB algorithm. Okay, this is a bit vague, but this was just for motivation. Uh, and now we'll state the algorithm itself formally. Okay, the algorithm is going to be parameterized by this uh, number alpha, uh, real number alpha, which is strictly positive. Uh, and it starts out much the same way as a naive heuristic. So in the first K rounds, we are going to play each arm exactly once. And uh, in all future time steps T after K, we will compute an index, what we call an index associated with each arm. And it's calculated as follows. So the first part of the index is just the sample mean reward as we did for our naive heuristic. So it's uh, mu hat on the i thumb uh, in the first nit place of the sum up to time t. So this is the sample mean reward on arm i up to time t. 
And then we add this extra bit, what we called our optimism bit in the heuristic. So again, you notice the one over square root n scaling. So we have nit, the number of arms we played, uh, number of times we played arm i up to time t in the denominator. Uh, we have an extra term which didn't come up in our heuristic. We are going to uh, not have a constant weight on the arm, but a weight that grows slowly with t. It grows like log t. Okay, and I'm not going to, I can't give an intuition for this. This, okay, this, this a bit comes, pops up like magic, but it turns out to be the right scaling when we do the analysis. Okay, uh, but I hope I've given at least some intuition to motivate why we are doing this, why we are looking at the sample mean and why we are adding an optimistic correction that gives more weight to arms which have not been played that often because there's less, there's more uncertainty about the true payoff, true reward on those arms. Okay, so this, so we calculate one such index for every arm and we can do this because at time t bigger or equal to k, nit is at least one for each arm. So everything here is well-defined. And once we have calculated these indices in round t plus one, we are going to play the arm with the biggest index or the highest index. Uh, if the rewards were continuous, had a continuous distribution, these, this the arm with the highest index would be unique with probability one. For us with Bernoulli arms, it's possible there are ties. And if there are ties, we just break them arbitrarily. I don't care how you break them. So the index of the arm played at time step t plus one is uh, any one of the indices which achieves the maximum here. And that's the algorithm. Okay, quite simple and fairly intuitive, except maybe for the log t term in the scaling and the parameter alpha. And uh, we'll see, uh, they'll play a role in the analysis, which we are going to look at next time. But that's it as far as the algorithm itself is concerned. Okay. It's a very simple algorithm and I hope it's completely clear. Okay, so uh, next time uh, we will uh, look at the analysis of that algorithm.